and welcome to We On. I'm Aisha Sindhu and this is The Insider. With us today is the man who's gone from India to the United States, from industrialist to political lobbyist. He put his full weight behind Donald Trump in the 2016 elections and has his fair share of supporters and critics alike. He's the founder of the Republican Hindu Coalition and the chairman of the Indian American Advisory Council to President Trump. He's also a member of uh, the Transition Finance uh, committees. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Mr. Shalab Kumar is here with us uh, in the studio. Welcome to Beyond, sir. Thank you uh, for joining us this uh, afternoon. Appreciate you taking out the time. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to start our discussion in just a bit. But before we do that, I want to give our viewers uh, a chance to understand what the last year has been like. Trump's first year in office has been a roller coaster ride. He's been accused of being divisive and short sighted. And yet the economy is reviving. Jobs are being added and wages are growing too. Here's a look at the United States under President Donald Trump. And I like him and I respect him. Very important signing. His worst critics would say Trump's 12 months in office have been 12 months too long. They say his instinct to fight, to divide, to disrupt and insult have redefined what it means to be presidential. Others say he's pushed boundaries in ways never seen before. They say he's remaking the office of the President of the United States, prodding institutions and smashing conventions. But there's little doubt that Trump has been deeply offensive and shocking. His description of some African countries as shitholes, a case in point. He never denied those words attributed to him. No, no, I'm not a racist. I am the least racist person you have ever interviewed. That I can tell you. But let's go back to 2017, to Trump's inaugural address on January 20th, which many saw as a diatribe against past presidents, and especially Barack Obama and the Washington establishment, which had scorned him. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated, in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. And his exclusive view of America. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth. And we will bring back our dreams. We will build new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways all across our wonderful nation. We will get our people off of welfare and back to work, rebuilding our country with American hands and American labor. We will follow two simple rules. Buy American and hire American. But the very next day, hundreds of thousands of women marched through the streets of major cities, denouncing and mocking their new president. They found him misogynistic and insulting of women. Banners and placards rejected his election. I'm for women's rights. Period. Because I'm old and I'm not going to last forever and I want to get, them, get a word in before I die. Uh, my wife and I have a two-year-old son and we're really worried about the future. The demonstrators reflected larger concerns, especially those of non-white minorities. Trump's election seems to have opened the doors to racism and white xenophobia. Reports by the Southern Poverty Law Center documented more than 80 incidents of hate crime on the evening Trump won the nomination. These included Nazi swastikas and graffiti spray-painted in Philadelphia. 
Trump scrawled on the door of a Muslim prayer room in New York University. A gay pride flag burnt in Rochester, New York. The effigy of a black man hung above the entrance to a coffee shop in Alabama. A statement from Trump's office confirms him describing Mexicans as rapists. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. And then at a rally in South Carolina in December 2015, he spelled it out. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Let's leave that aside and look at something which even Americans otherwise unhappy with Trump are cheering. The US economy added 2 million jobs in 2017. In the month of December alone, 148,000 jobs were added. Wages grew at 2.5%, unemployment remained at 4.1%. Key industries that gained were construction and manufacturing. He's walked out of the climate change treaty, although in recent days he's hinted that he could return to it. He's already scuttled the Trans-Pacific Partnership and is now threatening to tear up the transatlantic trade and investment partnership with Europe. The North American free trade area in his sights, notwithstanding warnings from US trade and industry. The North American Free Trade Agreement is in his sights, notwithstanding warnings from US trade and industry. He even threatened to undo a free trade agreement with South Korea, signed in 2007. Korea will never waver. Trump has even taken aim at the $24 billion trade deficit with India. The US commerce industry officials have indicated that India's exports of steel, gems and jewellery, automobiles and components, food and leather could be potential targets for restrictions unless New Delhi took steps to reduce the deficit. It's a bit of a wonder how the $300 billion plus trade deficit with China is less of an issue, while $24 billion with India is at the receiving end. On the positive side, though, he received Narendra Modi at the White House, has pushed to expand the bilateral relationship, been tough on Pakistan and backed the Quad to limit China's expansion. Trump's sabre-rattling on North Korea has deepened fears that he may be readying for the unthinkable, a military strike. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. Will 2018 see Trump temper some of his worst instincts? The American people have in successive opinion polls indicated that he should tweet less and react less to every remark about him in public. Others say he should stop making false and misleading statements, listen more to his advisors and reach out to a divided America. 2018 could be Trump's year to set things right if he wants to. Bureau Report, Leon. Right, so that was a recap of the first year of uh, the United States under President Donald Trump. With me in the studio, as I mentioned earlier, is Shalab Kumar, the founder and chairman of the Republican Hindu Coalition. Mr. Kumar, uh, once again, thanks for joining us. You've been uh, associated very closely with the campaign and, of course, with the presidency. Tell me, do you feel that the United States is better off today than it was a year ago? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here and just a little correction. I'm not a lobbyist. Okay. Uh, There's a technical term. Uh, you could call me an issue advocate, and I'm a, a friend of uh, President Trump. But Fair enough. The uh, Kumar family shares a lot of uh, common things with the uh, Trump family, and uh, we are fairly close. Okay. And uh, now, in terms of uh, whether the United States is better off uh, a year from now, I mean, you will uh, mark my statement that that will be a, uh, a totally different than you know what is sort of being described here. Mm -hmm. Uh, in last February, February of 2017, I declared, um, it was my statement, that President Trump has the potential of bringing Ram Rajya to the United States. Yes. In October, uh, in public and as well as uh, private, on October 17, uh, even when the tax bill has not passed, I declared that President Trump truly has brought 
Ram Rajya to the United States. There is not even a question, scintilla of question or any front, mm -hmm. any front that the uh, United States is so much better off. I call uh, President Trump as Reagan on steroids. Oh. And, uh, uh, you know, what uh, President uh, Reagan, who is the most favorite president of mine mm -hmm. in the 20th century, what he accomplished in eight years, uh, I have no doubt that President Trump is accomplishing that in the very just first four years. Right, and you have talked about this previously as well. You've harked back to the 80s, which you said was a golden era for the United States, and you say that that's happening uh, with President Trump in power. But a shutdown within the first year of his presidency, of him taking charge, that doesn't inspire much confidence, though, does see it? The, actually, the shutdown, uh, which happened for three days. You're talking about the three days. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Shutdown. The Democrats very quickly realized that they made a mistake and then they backed off. Uh, why would uh, anybody shut down the government of the United States, shut down its military uh, for the sake of illegal arrivals? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be uh, if Prime Minister Modi uh, has to take out all the troops from border of Pakistan uh, because some Bangladeshi immigrants have come in and some people in here want to grant them citizenship and all the rights. So over that issue... But then there was the division between essential and non-essential and uh, the military was termed as an essen essential category and things did continue to run the way uh, they were meant to as far as those essential elements of the US uh, you know, machinery go. So, um, and of course the, the critics say that though the deal that was you know, uh, put together so that the shutdown comes to an end quickly was a short term deal. Do you think that's problematic? Do you think that the, the vision to, to see it through to a long term deal is something that is going to need bipartisan support and that is something President Trump is having difficulty with. See, uh, your viewers uh, and across the world need to understand one thing, that the uh, even though uh, in U.S. Congress, uh, our party, uh, Republican Party, has majority, yes. uh, that is 51 in the Senate, but for uh, issues that are not budget related issues, you need 60 votes Yes. because otherwise you could do a, a filibuster. So now what is happening there, uh, Democrats, what they're doing is uh, the nine people who need to cross over, uh, they thought that with every uh, shutdown in the past that they will score a victory, mm -hmm. a political victory. And so they gambled and our president, a uh, very, very strong believer, a firm in his policy, and he said, okay, uh, I'm going to cause minimum pain. Uh, in the past, whenever there's a shutdown, it's, it's uh, um, done on a purpose to cause pain so that there could be political advantage and disadvantage. Here, sure. what he did is minimum pain within the weekend. It was shut down on Friday. Fair enough, By I accept Monday, that. They and there knew have been uh, numerous they, shut, uh, shutdowns they, in the past, and this was, of course, one of the shortest ones shortest that the one U.S. has seen. and also most benign one. And then that's why if you look at the vote on uh, Monday, 81 Democrats all came the other way. Right. Initially, they were uh, dead set that DACA has to be taken care of right. if there's going to be a reopening of the government. Sure. They In fact, that, that's, that's, a, that's an issue that is very close to your heart. It is something that the RHC has spoken of uh, aggressively. I was reading some of the pamphlets as well that the RHC has come up with as far as DACA goes. What is your uh, organization hope for, uh, from the Trump administration, at least in the coming year? Let's just talk about 2018. Okay, just the, on the immigration side. Yes. You're talking about mm -hmm. on the immigration side. So the, you see, the immigration uh, people really also need to understand this issue um, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, today, in the United States, over the number of years, a policy has developed that we uh, give green cards to close to one million people in the, in the United States. We admit. Right. Out of that, uh, your viewers will be shocked to hear that 800,000 are unskilled workers. Unskilled workers are 800,000, primarily from south of the border, primarily from Mexico, Mexico and uh, South America. Right. Only 8,000 green cards are issued to highly skilled workers from India. Mm -hmm. 8,000 versus 800,000. Right. So therefore, the backlog for green cards in India of high-skilled people has grown to 60 
60 plus years. Yes, right. And the president is pushing very much for skill based, merit based, not basis on the basis of country. Mm -hmm. uh, it should not matter whether you are coming from India or you're coming from Uzbekistan or you're coming from, if you have people more talented that are coming from India, take them. Mm -hmm. Base, go on a point based system. Right. Now, uh, so, you know, on the other side, it's, it's really vote bank politics. Mm -hmm. The uh, Democrats on the other side would like to have uh, as many people from the other category. Right. So uh, that's what the little bit of a struggle is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, nobody's talking about, President Trump is not talking about sending those DACA people, mm -hmm. that is the deferred action on childhood arrivals right. to send back, but they also should recognize, which we are raising this issue, there are, where there are 690,000 DACA kids. Mm -hmm. There are also 200 to 250,000 of what we call DALCA kids. These are legal childhood right. arrivals right. of the people of the highly skilled force that goes to United States uh, on H-1B visa or other employment-based visas. And since the wait is so long, because only 8,000 are getting admitted, so these kids who came to the United States, four years old, six years old, 10 years old, when they become 21. They lose their status. They as, lose their right, status. Right. So we are raising that issue uh, in a big way. And president is in generally in, in support of this. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically wants the best and the brightest uh, to come to the uh, United States. And uh, India has uh, to offer that. Absolutely. Stay with me a second, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, I just want to take our viewers through um, the contours also of the relationship between India and the United States. Of course, uh, we've seen that relationship develop a lot. That's something I really want to take up with uh, Mr. Kumar in a bit. Um, we're talking about what President Trump, for instance, wants when it comes to uh, the relationship with India. What are his hopes when it comes to India's uh, support to the United States? There is, of course, the, the question of Afghanistan, for instance, where the United States has been fighting its longest uh, war. Uh, the U.S. is hopeful that uh, India will support uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, the United States further in Afghanistan. There's also the question of military equipment. Does, uh, you know, India being one of the largest importers of arms, is the United States hoping uh, to tap into that defense market here in India? And of course, the question of North Korea. The United States has found itself, you know, in a situation with North Korea. It's been looking for support from all quarters. Is India they're one of those strategic partners. And while staying with Asia, we need to talk about also China. China's aggressive politics and policies in the Indo-Pacific region. Is the United States looking at India as a partner to counter China's aggressive overtures in the region? Are you concerned, sir, that a uh, you know, the latest Time magazine cover, for instance, we, we'll get to the other uh, specifics of the, uh, that question in a bit. It turns the United States into an isolated force. The, the map shows the U.S. in the center and all these countries uh, to the side. The president's uh, rhetoric on North Korea has, you know, uh, caused a great degree of concern in various parts of the world. Do you think that that's been part of the problem that the U.S. is being looked at as an isolated force today? Absolutely not. Okay. In fact, uh, what President uh, Trump is very clear on and what we are very clear on, what is happening, we do not want China to become world hegemon. Uh -huh. China has got so much money uh -huh. because it became the manufacturing center of the world, is sitting with $4 trillion in cash and uh, creating trouble everywhere uh, for India as well as for the United States. Right. And, and they want to be the superpower. Uh -huh. They want to be the superpower uh, at the expense of the United States, no matter what they say uh, out in public, but that is their internal game. And that's what their internal um, wish is. And uh, unless uh, the trade balance between U.S. and China uh, is curtailed, right. yes, it is $300 billion, $400 billion uh, per year, mm -hmm. unless that is uh, taken care of, unless this is brought down in significant ways. And uh, there are a lot of forces within uh, the uh, Trump administration. And uh, I'm part of that. I'm, uh, uh, glad to be part of that uh, is my favorite subject mm -hmm. to um, uh, uh, to slow down the imports uh, from uh, China to to United States and get it more balanced. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, that's where it is at. And, and the United States is not alone and it's not isolated. When the United States is the most powerful country uh, on, on this planet, right. when that is a true leader, uh, then things move, things change. And, and you are seeing that. You say that yes, you're seeing absolutely. that happening. Um, as far as the relationship with India goes, you know, uh, there are two individuals at front and center of it. There's President Trump and Prime Minister Modi. And, and many have credited you as the architect for, in many ways, that, uh, you know, relationship burgeoning in, uh, in many ways. Do you think it's important for us to understand the relationship, to understand how exactly the bilateral ties are going to develop in the years to come? Um, fundamentally, the chemistry between the two countries and uh, the two people is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, there is every reason to believe that if the overall politics is handled right, United States and India should be the strongest, closest allies in the world. Just like US and UK are tied to the hip, mm -hmm. US and India could be those two very, very strong partners right. and uh, so you know there's going to be some hiccups here and there mm -hmm. but basic premise is there and one of the things uh, president totally understands he gets it where his um, best support is going to come from and that is uh, India during the uh, election campaign uh, we uh, were very instrumental in educating him on uh, India on Hindus right. uh, peace loving Hindus and peace loving Indians and Pakistan and and uh, at that time he uh, for a while he, uh, he listened to us uh, excuse me evolved into a policy that was uh, pro India mm -hmm. and he has kept all his promises right okay um but, but don't you see also that they are on opposing sides on some important issues, for instance, climate change, globalization, um, immigration, because uh, uh, Mr. Modi is very keen on sending India's uh, best uh, overseas. The president, uh, on the other hand, is a bit protectionist when it comes to who all are coming into the United States. And, of course, Israel. We've seen, uh, you know, India uh, not mm -hmm. ratify the president's decision to uh, declare Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So, and these aren't lightweight issues. Do you feel that, that uh, those are going to be snags in the relationship? Uh, not, not really. See, okay. uh, you look at, first of all, immigration, as we were talking. Mm -hmm. uh, both are on the same page. Uh, president wants the best and the brightest from India mm -hmm. and uh, wants to legislate, uh, have Congress legislate policies that are merit-based uh, immigration. All right. So they, they are on the, um, on the same page. Okay. Globalist. You talk about globalist. Uh, India doesn't really want to be a globalist. Globalist means imports. Mm -hmm. Globalist means uh, China, <laughs> uh, a favorite policy for China. China wants globalist so it could dump its uh, products everywhere in the world. But the president recently at, uh, at Davos said, uh, you know, he took a very different stance as far, as far as globalization goes. He says that the United States is open for business. That was a very strong message that was sent out just uh, yesterday when he was at Davos. So it, for many of his supporters, it seemed like he was backtracking on some of the promises that he'd made in his campaign about America first, jobs for America first, and therefore, uh, why invite business from outside of uh, the United States? You see, uh, sometimes people who try to dissect each word mm -hmm. which comes out of his mouth, they get confused. I'm not confused at all okay. when I hear America first, America, American jobs, uh, and, and that's how it should be uh, for Indians. It should be making uh, India mm -hmm. and should be India first. Uh, there is no problem with that. And, and uh, when he says uh, United States is open for business, it's natural. <laughs> we should say that. So you're saying it's, it's, it's in a supportive role to the concept of make America great again. Is yeah, this? bring in, you see, right now, just look at what has happened. I mean, when I say Ram Rajya, just imagine, do you imagine Apple pulling out 200 billion plus dollars out of Europe and bringing it back to the United States? And, uh, you know, there are over 5 million uh, workers, everyday workers in the United States, because of the tax bill passed, have gotten a $1,000 bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's a large <laughs> bonus. Fair enough. And, and, and so everywhere there are signs of great prosperity, uh, even though it is America first. Basic uh, situation is when America rises, when America is strong, world rises, world economy rises, 
When the economy rises, everywhere you create jobs, uh, the only imbalance, the biggest imbalance is China. And that will be corrected. Okay, uh, let's circle back to immigration for a second because that's come up a few times. Uh, the visa lottery system has, of course, been uh, problematic uh, for the RHC, for a number of uh, people that say that it's unfair. How do you see um, changes being brought about to the visa lottery system that will benefit both the United States and Indian IT workers who you know, make their way across uh, to the U.S. in large numbers year on year? Okay, first of all, I said there are one million green cards issued every year. Our position is even in we should decrease that number uh, to 750,000, cut it down by 25%. Okay, but out of the 750,000, issue visas at least uh, 400,000 to people of uh, with high skills mm -hmm. that will contribute to the U.S. economy, and and the very very large percentage of that almost 70 to 80 percent of that will be people from India. Mm -hmm. There's already a backlog of over half a million to a million H-1B uh, visa holders whose green cards have been approved. But because of this long 60-year line, mm -hmm. they are waiting and waiting and waiting. So uh, we need to absorb those. That will be great for American economy. American economy needs 400,000 high-skilled IT people per year to have a 4% GDP growth. Fair enough. So, there's, uh, they, so they're on the same page. Right, and there, 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 there are problems within the system that need to be addressed on an urgent war footing. We'll have to leave it at that. We've run out of time completely. Mr. Shalab Kumar, thank you so much for joining us uh, it, at Weon today. Appreciate you taking out the time to give us an idea of uh, what's going on in the U.S. Thanks. Aisha, thanks for having me here, and uh, nice to be with your view, uh, viewers. Thanks. Thank you.